welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're here today to talk about the implications of the digital iron curtain um, that we're seeing in, in Russia and in the Ukraine. Um, thank you for joining us. We put this together at relatively short notice, but we thought it important uh, to describe what's going on um, because we all see a reference to the digital iron curtain in the news. Um, but I wanted to get to, together with one of the leading experts uh, in the world on this topic, my colleague and friend, Laura Denardis, to talk about what it is that's actually going on and, and probably more importantly, what the implications of that, that are. Uh, my name is Aaron Shaw. I'm the Managing Director and General Counsel at CG. It's, it's great to have you with us. Um, so we've seen a lot of different things happening recently. Uh, Russia banned Instagram. Uh, they previously banned Facebook and uh, limited access to Twitter. Um, there's also plans to centralize control over the, the country's internet access, what, the, what, what they're calling the Sovereign Internet Project, or RUNet. At the same time, private companies are actually taking efforts as well. And there's an internet governance dimension with the global internet domain uh, uh, not-for-profit that runs basically runs the internet, something called ICANN, which we'll, we'll get into in greater detail, was asked by the Ukrainian government to remove Russian domains from the global web. And there's also Russian activity in the Ukraine. So there's a complicated interrelationship between all of these things that we're going to get into. Um, and I'm delighted to have uh, Laura with us. Uh, Laura is a globally recognized scholar on internet governance. Um, she's uh, at the American University. Uh, she's a professor there. She's faculty director at the Internet Governance Lab. She's a senior fellow with CG, and she previously was the research director for the Global Commission on Internet Governance. So there's probably no finer person in the world to explain this to us. Um, and Laura has an uncanny ability to describe complex technological arrangements in a manner that, that I can understand. Um, so she can really get to the bottom of it uh, in a manner that's accessible um, and open and forthright. Um, we do wanna be able to take questions throughout. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will try and get to as many as we possibly can. Um, and I'm just going to I'm just going to jump right in because we only have an hour together. Um, and I, Laura, I really want to explore a lot of this with you. Um, and I want to start with one of your books. So you you previously wrote a book called the the Global War for Internet Governance. I mean, it was it was somewhat prescient, but that book starts. And I'm just going to read uh, the, the one of the opening lines: Conflicts over internet architecture and governance are the new spaces where political power is unfolding in the world, including around national security. I mean, this seems more relevant, uh, I think, than ever in light of this kind of horrific invasion that we've seen of the Ukraine and how this is now unfolding through digital sanctions. So can you can you talk to us a little bit about that, Laura? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Aaron, for having me. And I just want to say a quick thank you for those that are joining us. I'm scanning through the names and very much looking forward to the Q&A section and getting a variety of perspectives on this topic. Uh, we are seeing uh, how digital infrastructure is a proxy for geopolitics right now in a variety of different ways. And as Aaron said, the digital sanctions, and let's, let's just call it the digital iron curtain around the Russian war on Ukraine has many different dimensions. You know, one is um, inside of Russia, there's inside of Ukraine, and, and separately what is originating from external private forces outside of the region. So let's just begin with that issue. Uh, because it's so so interesting and also so contentious. Technology crosses borders, Aaron, as you know, in a way that has no natural correspondence with, with sovereign uh, national boundaries. And what we're seeing is private companies reaching across these borders using control of technology and, and boycotts around technology as an economic and political proxy. So this has unfolded very quickly in a historic and you know, massive surge of uh, privatized digital sanctions in which companies are basically withdrawing services and products and in some cases networks from Russia. I'm a little hesitant us using the word sanctions, uh, but I am. Um, it usually refers to governmental action and it, uh, they usually are economic san sanctions. And what we see is the digitization uh, the technological mediation of sanctions coming primarily from the private sector. We certainly have had historic episodes of uh, private companies boycotting before, um, you know, throughout history. But what's a little bit different here is that in the present moment, we have the digital mediation of 
basically everything, uh, you know, the public sphere, certainly. And then we have the privatization of the conditions of national security, of civil liberties, and essentially the flow of information uh, within that sphere. So the internet is in everything. Everything is, um, is affected by a disruption. So this phenomenon and um, you know, issues that we discussed certainly on the Global Commission for Internet Governance, it's unfolding, it's laid the groundwork for what's happening around Russia. Uh, we've been tracking um, in the Internet Governance Lab the different kinds of, uh, of private, private sanctions. And they really seem to, I don't wanna like suggest a taxonomy, but it, you know, just roughly, it seems like they fall into five categories. One is um, the sale of device and hardware. This is obvious. You see many tech companies from Apple to Samsung to Sony PlayStation, the chip manufacturers, uh, Cisco, switch manufacturers. They are, it's a massive list of announcements about um, curtailing sales. Another category is, and you could make this into many subcategories, but I'll just call it software and software services. Um, everything from the DuckDuckGo search engine to um, the Bumble dating app to Microsoft to um, what's re really interesting is uh, some cybersecurity software companies. And I, I would also put financial intermediaries um, in this category, such as PayPal halting uh, payment to Russia. Um, now, there's also a, a, um, a government connection here. Uh, Google and others have removed Russian state media. RT and Sputnik, I believe, from um, various kinds of information intermediaries because of the EU sanctions around this. There's another category around entertainment and streaming. There's a category around social media platforms. Even TikTok uh, has restricted service. But I think uh, finally, the, the most stunning category and the one that's most complicated from the standpoint of internet governance, architecture and values, that involves um, network operators uh, withdrawing, disconnecting um, their networks uh, from Russia, including major internet backbone providers like uh, Cogent and Lumen. So whether or not one agrees with these decisions, and there are values and tension, which I'm sure we will get into, I don't think anyone, I, at least I could not have predicted how it would be so swift, massive, total, and uh, a, a complete global collective action among technology companies. Of course, there are still other companies that have chosen not to shut down, saying that Russian citizens need access. But uh, coming back to Aaron's question about the global war for internet governance, yes, conflicts over internet architecture and governance, often inside of a black box of technology, some of it seen in this case, some of it unseen, they're the new spaces where um, national security power is unfolding. And the control struggles over this, I think we'll increasingly see are going to mediate um, how we go forward um, and in the same way that these control struggles are mediating already disinformation, privacy, and other forms of international conflict. So I want to pick up on that, but I really, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying this to be hyperbolic, but I really appreciate the categorization that you've done. Like it, when you're talking about sanction, it's, in, it's important to, to understand what we mean and the way that you've broke it out, I think is, is really sound. But I want to pick up on this, this thread about internet governance and the root zone. So we've got these, these sanctions in place, but there was a call from the Ukraine to, to remove Russia from the root zone. And I bet you, if you polled a thousand people, 999 of them would have no idea what the root zone actually is, notwithstanding the fact that we all interact with it literally every day. So could you just, can you explain what the root zone actually is? And then as an adjunct, could you actually then describe who made the call to refuse the Ukraine's re request? Absolutely. And there are a lot of acronyms in this space. I'll try to not use very many, but I apologize. And maybe uh, someone could just unpack the acronyms in the, the chat or the, the Q&A. Um, putting this in context, the internet's technical and internet governance uh, community has largely, uh, at least the major institutions have largely rejected calls to wholly disconnect or uh, the media is calling it unplug uh, Russia from the internet. And the, the, the backdrop of this is that the Ukrainian Ministry of Digital Transformation asked ICANN that's the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and also um, a, a group called RIPE NCC, which is a regional internet registry. They're basically responsible for IP addresses in that region. 
to essentially disconnect uh, Russia. Now, what exactly would that entail? Uh, there are a number of dimensions of this. Uh, one would be um, changing the domain name system, you know, root servers related to Russia. I'll get into that in a second. Some involved um, security infrastructure like digital certificates. And in some cases, um, like RIPE NCC doesn't actually have any um, involvement in that, but I'm, I'm just saying what was, what was requested. And uh, the two main ones though, the, a request to withdraw the rights of Russian networks to use IP addresses, and then removing the Russian country code top level domain .ru and a few others from the root zone file of the internet. Now, as Aaron said, uh, and I agree with you, understanding this requires understanding well, what is ICANN? What is the domain name system? What is the root zone file? What are IP addresses? Um, if there is a center of the internet, it is these technologies. Uh, the domain name system, it actually serves a pretty uh, specific function and an important one. It translates between human readable domain names such as cgonline.org um, and uh, th that we understand and the IP addresses, think about like 32 zeros and ones in a row, they're unique addresses that uh, computers understand and routers use to um, find information online. So it's, people describe it as the internet's phone book because of that. It's distributed, it's a, a massive database management system, it's spread out um, in, administratively over many different institutions that handle and keep an authoritative record of this mapping between names and numbers for each what's called domain or area of the internet. And uh, ICANN is um, the global multi-stakeholder not-for-profit organization that really coordinates the, the system as an ecosystem, including the very top of the DNS hierarchy, which is called, and it, it's, uh, it's more complicated than this, but I'll just say it simply, the root zone file, which maps the names and numbers for the very top of this system for the top level domains. Now, top level domains are the apex of this hierarchy, and most people are familiar with like .ca, .uk, .com, .org, .edu. Uh, these are top level domains. Some of them are generic top level domains and others are associated with um, countries. So .ru is one of these and uh, pulling .ru from the root zone was the request and, uh, and from the DNS that would essentially unplug the sites that have that top level domain suffix .ru from the internet. So it would be like pulling all the .com addresses out. ICANN and RIPE um, NCC rejected the Ukrainian uh, government's request to do this um, very broad action. And I think, you know, in my opinion, from um, trying to, to keep my ear down in the many different institutions, it seems like a consensus position is emerging or maybe even has emerged among the institutions of internet governance that the core virtual substrate of the internet that I would say that would also include border gateway protocol and interconnection um, as well as the DNS, that that should remain universally operational. Um, and in, in the case of RIPE NCC, I'll say one, one more thing about this and some of their rationales, Aaron, for um, not withdrawing IP addresses they, um, RIPE NCC, and I, I actually have a quote here, they were asked to withdraw the right to use IPv4 and IPv6 addresses by all Russian members of the RIPE NCC. Now they refused for many reasons. One is they said they don't have a mandate to do that. Um, they can't do it unilaterally, they said, and that even if they could, they believe that IP addresses are not an ideal mechanism for enforcing these political concerns. And, that, and also if they did, it would have long-term implications for the open internet. So that's a really uh, complicated set of technologies and institutions. Um, and uh, that's a quick summary of what we're talking about. No, for sure. And it's like a master's class in internet governance in three minutes, but basically at, at its most basic level, this, this, this internet corporation for assigned names and numbers that kind of makes the internet go was asked more or less to rip 
the Rus Russian domains out of the internet by the Ukraine by the by the Ukrainian government, and they said no. So I guess I'm struck by by this juxtaposition because so you got private companies that are moving unilaterally and cutting Russia off. Then you got the internet governance institution saying, "Well, hold on a minute, we're not we're not going to do that." So what explains this this these two approaches? You know how effective how effective is 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 kind of either of them? Which one's the 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 right one in your mind? And then maybe just walk us through like are citizens still able to get on the internet? Like what's it look what is what does it look like in Russia right now if you're just a regular Russian citizen? Yes, this this question that Aaron asks about when to pull an internet kill switch, if I can call it that, it's a critical and politically important one. And um, first of all, it does remind us that there are many kill switches from interconnection to virtual resources, to cloud computing, to the DNS. And um, I, I think we have to historicize this. <clears throat> so some of these, th there are examples of um, implementations of these various decisions to cut off uh, citizens or countries in the past. Um, some of these come from governments the Egyptian government cutting off access to the internet for citizens, uh, cutting off internet access and mobile phone access. I think that's probably the uh, best, best known example during a time of protest. Um, in India, there are uh, a variety of reasons that governmental actors order outages. Um, censorship in China, I would put in that category, using the DNS actually, and using routing, systems of routing and filtering. Um, many examples are also from private, uh, from private industry. Uh, it's very important to go through this history because um, you, you have to, to say that a great deal of thought, scholarship, policy making, and discussion, we certainly discuss this a lot on the Global Commission for Internet Governance, um, goes into when, when something should be blocked. And I would say that uh, concern about disinformation that has been going on for the last few years is part of this. Um, and some of these have come from private industry. The best examples are Amazon, Amazon Web Services cutting off uh, Parler, uh, you know, deplatforming an entire social media uh, company, Twitter deleting accounts. So there, there's a history of this. There also have been previous calls, and this is a very important historical point. And I've written about this a lot. Um, some of the, the people I see, the participants on this, um, this event, they've written about it. Um, there have been previous calls for internet governance institutions to serve as a kill switch. And um, even, even with the root zone file, Aaron, do you, are you familiar with any of these? There was a, a request to, um, well, some countries objected, for example, to the .gay uh, top level domain. Uh, there's another example involving .ir. Um, the same the, thing with .xxx as well too, right? .xxs was, yeah. that came from the U.S. Um, that was that was that's a very old example and a good one um, about how these values and tension happen. Um, and uh, the plaintiff lawsuit around .ir requesting that I can hand over .ir. That's another one. So there there is a lot that has happened. Um, many requests, um, a lot of politicization of the domain name system over time, as well as the content intermediaries. So that brings us up to the present moment. And the way that I would say this, and I'm just going to give my opinion on this, um, you know, as a scholar, but also someone who has been involved in internet architecture uh, throughout my entire life as an engineer and also involved in policy engaged uh, scholarship. Um, private companies have the right to make their own decisions about their own products and services, whether to sell, whether to cut off, whether to moderate content. And this is why we have a very long um, circumstance in which social media companies have been able to delete and block speech that would be considered objectionable, but would be perfectly legal, uh, especially in the United States protected by the first amendment. So they make these decisions, they take down things that would be protected speech if a government made that call. Um, but the question about what global internet governance institutions should do is a completely separate matter, in my opinion. And I actually agree with the decisions uh, to keep the core common infrastructure, if I can call it that. I, I think that's actually an accurate description, the core common infrastructure of the internet, much of it is logical and not physical, to keep that um, operational, which then 
allows for the decisions of private and other actors who run services on top of this logical infrastructure to make decisions. And I mentioned the two really high profile um, ones, ICANN and RIPE NCC. Um, now, um, I, I wanna also to, to just suggest that if one believes as I do that people inside Russia are an avenue of resistance, then some communication channels should be kept open for any possibility of uh, countering disinformation, enabling dissidents to speak, um, keeping channels open uh, between families in Russia and uh, between Russia and the Ukraine. And then also just um, having any possibility of an open and universal internet going into the future. So I know that many people disagree with me, uh, but that I think that that uh, channel of information is very important. And what's interesting, just coming to the last part of your question, Aaron, is that they still are able to communicate. Um, the, so the two network operators that pulled out, uh, they're still connecting, I, I'm sure, at internet exchange points outside of Russia, which then can bring uh, content into Russia, and there are other network operators. So there may be reduced bandwidth. I haven't seen evidence of that yet. But um, keeping that internet channel open is very important for the possibility of resistance and counter disinformation. Yeah, I was just going to say, look, look, if I was a, if I was a, an autocrat or a dictator and I was trying to control the information space in my country, um, this would be great, right? Private companies pulling out, and then you're going to try and exercise domestic message control, right? It's a tale as old as time, right? Uh, in terms of advancing a, uh, advancing an, an agenda, so we're talking about censorship and, and bans on platforms um, in in Russia. I'm curious, um, like, what specific actions has 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 Putin himself taken inside the country to control that digital space and that information ecosystem? Well, inside of if we can call it the digital iron curtain. There are many different approaches to technologies of control that are unfolding, and some of them existed prior to this war on Ukraine. And I would also suggest that there are technologies of resistance, and it's just as important to, uh, to look at that and examine that. So what's happening on the control side? Uh, many different things. Well, the Kremlin has at least partially blocked uh, social media companies um, of, of a variety, a diverse variety of them. They've pressured people, they've personally pressured people who work for these companies. There's a human element of this. Um, they've engaged in textbook draconian media repression, outlawing certain words like war and invasion. They've created a chilling, um, I guess there's nothing we can say other than using the word punitive, a punitive censorship environment that has essentially halted um, all independent mainstream journalism. So that's happening as well. And then uh, um, another category is, and this is, this is the most disturbing, is bombing, disrupting, targeting um, it, with weapons, but also with cyber weapons, targeting <clears throat> Ukrainian information and communication infrastructure. So that's unfolding. But I, I wanna just jump on your question by um, asking another question. And, and that's like, what, well, what about resistance? There are also technologies of dissent and technologies of resistance that are happening. So VPNs, um, secure messaging apps, anonymizing technologies. Um, if you look at the number of apps downloaded and the, the uh, information that's put out by major um, app mediation companies like Apple and Google, there's been a spike in Russia of VPN app downloads um, Aaron, you well know that's a privacy and uh, security enhancing tool that can mask an IP address and then enable someone to um, access something that's banned within a certain geographical area, uh, such as accessing uh, the Washington Post from, um, from Russia. Um, and because it encrypts communications, it also helps resist surveillance. But there's also been an increase in downloads of end-to-end um, -end encrypted secure messaging apps like Signal and increased use of Tor, uh, which is an anonymizing technology. So in short, we have technologies of control, technologies of resistance and um, policies of control, uh, repression, but um, at the same time, very courageous, um, inspirational human acts of resistance, protesting uh, the editor who walked onto a live broadcast holding up an anti-war sign so there's been that kind of resistance, but
but tracking along with that is the technologies of resistance that provide um, some help to citizens trying to communicate, access information, and evade authoritarian digital control. So it's precisely because of this resistance and the tension between control and um, freedom that the internet needs to stay open in, in, um, for Russian citizen activists. So I'm gonna maybe abstract this one level then. So, so we've been kind of talking a lot about what's happening on the, on the digital ground, right? So you've got private companies moving to disconnection. You've got the kind of global architecture of the internet refusing that disconnection. You got Russia doing its own thing kind of regarding message control internally. Um, so you and I met many years ago on the Global Commission for Internet Governance. We were actually looking at the internet as a whole and how it's how it is it is governed. And I'm I want to abstract one level and get away from the the what's happening on the digital ground and talk about any insights that you that you see for digital governance and internet governance more generally based on what's taking place right now. Yes, and what's really interesting to me is that the insights about the nature of global internet governance arising from this, um, you know, historic, uh, you know, uh, brutal war on Ukraine, um, it's exactly the same as the insights that, you know, we've been discussing for decades. So one of them is that th- that 99% of the infrastructure of the internet is not visible in the same way that content and content platforms are visible, yet there is a tremendous amount of power in them. And uh, that, you know, in this example and, and the contention over these, uh, the, the control and the freedom around these technologies, um, a lot of it is beneath the surface. It's always been politicized by a variety of actors. Uh, so that cybersecurity, interconnection, critical internet resource, resources, the DNS, definitely. So that's, um, not visible to end users in the same way, but it's incredibly powerful. Um, a second theme, um, I would say the privatization of governance in this arena. It's often called the private sector led uh, multi-stakeholder governance model. Here you see many examples of private actors making decisions that essentially mirror what uh, sovereign nation decisions would look like in a different century. Um, third insight actually is about the multi-stakeholder model. Um, I think everyone is seeing that um, there are many different actors. Uh, no one entity is in charge of the internet. Um, and what is highly significant is that um, you see the role of the technical community and the core architecture. You see uh, private entities that own and operate the networks and you see um, you know, citizen civil society acting in different ways. And Aaron, you might remember some of the press questions asked to us on the Global Commission on Internet Governance. And so here's an example of one. Well, who should control the internet? And that question makes absolutely no sense because there are many different um, functions and tasks necessary to keep it operational and also many different actors and institutions that are responsible. So I think it's laying bare that model and how the ecosystem of governance works. Um, I'll mention two others. Infrastructure as a proxy for politics. Uh, This turn to infrastructure for internet governance and for uh, political um, objectives, this is definitely not new. As I mentioned before, there's been a long history of using, for example, the DNS for intellectual property rights enforcement, but also for censorship. I could go on and on about examples of how infrastructure is a proxy for other kinds of objectives. And then I would say, and this may be the most difficult and important um, takeaway for internet governance is that in these technically complicated and sometimes concealed areas with many different institutions and requiring a lot of technical expertise, um, there are always values and tension. So I, I'm an engineer by training, an information engineer. I started my life designing um, you know, network security systems and um, helping companies get on the internet. And it, it has struck me always from the beginning how there are values and tension and you know, the, the, the engineering of it is not neutral. You have to make decisions and there's always a tension. And in this case, you see a very real tension. Well, you see many tensions, but one of them is uh, the need to enact sanctions to try to exert pressure on Russia versus the hope that ongoing connectivity might help 
create that open channel for Russian citizen encounter disinformation, for example. So um, I could go on and on about that, but I think that those insights about how internet governance works is, um, is really important around this particular incident. No, and I appreciate it. And it, it, it strikes me, right, like a lot of the public discourse and certainly the policy, the policy relevant discourse has really shifted to the content layer, right, or the application layer. So it's really like a lot of it is about platform governance. And I'm just going to throw a plug in here for my colleague, Bob Fay, who leads our work on platform governance. Um, they're doing some really exceptional stuff. I will ask my colleagues to throw a link um, to some of Bob's work. Uh, in the chat, but there's a there's a there's a, a big discussion at the content layer. But what you're talking about is the infrastructure layer. Um, and so, and it, for this is going to be foreign for a lot of people because, like, literally most of it is like who's getting kicked off Twitter? What are the Facebook boards rules of review? Like, how do we mediate at the content layer? Um, this is a very different thing. And so, could you just like maybe? I don't know, give us like a couple of examples of how the infrastructure is used for this kind of content control. Absolutely. I've always, well, content control, laws about content, uh, content moderation, these are incredibly important issues. And we certainly um, see that happening now. We see it um, you know, with disinformation and, uh, around COVID-19. Uh, so I don't want to diminish the importance of that, but there is even more power in infrastructure to enact certain kinds of public policy outcomes. Uh, some uh, I would consider to be uh, salutary and you know, helpful to society, some are not helpful. Um, and infrastructure has always provided these control points. So some examples would be the longstanding use of uh, the domain name system to enforce intellectual property rights, uh, rights online. So some people may have, you know, perhaps accidentally gone to a site that has, um, count, you know, copyrighted, uh, illegal copyrighted information or uh, selling trademarked, uh, selling like uh, trademarked goods, uh, luxury knockoffs, uh, counterfeit pharmaceutical uh, products. And then they would get redirected by the DNS to a law enforcement message. So that's the use of the DNS to carry out laws around intellectual property rights. Um, another example would be the systems of filtering and routing um, in China for censorship. Um, I mentioned uh, before AWS, Amazon Web Services taking down Parler. Now Amazon Web Services is, it, that's not a, like really a content intermediary. It's sort of a substrate below that. So cloud computing, uh, hosting services, that can deplatform an entire social media company. Um, I'll, I'll give another example. This one is speculative. So if um, former President Trump has a new social media company and S Apple believes that there's objectionable content on it, that app could be removed from the app store. So app mediation is definitely part of this. Um, there are many examples. Uh, the Internet Governance Lab colleagues and I have actually have a book about this. It's called The Turn to Infrastructure and Internet Governance. Uh, we talk about um, you know, cloud computing providers, uh, the DNS, uh, search engines, um, and also uh, financial intermediaries such as PayPal uh, deciding, and Visa also deciding to take down WikiLeaks uh, long ago. It, it includes data localization arrangements um, to try to enact privacy. It includes um, issues around interconnection for surveillance. So yes, this is a very powerful form of control in society to try to either tamper with the infrastructure or to co-opt the infrastructure for various um, economic and political objectives. So I want to maybe pick up on that theme then and talk a, a little bit about the governance around the infrastructure and, and the, the multi-stakeholder governance of the internet. And this will be a foreign concept uh, for, for many. If you've never been to an ICANN meeting, you really should go. It's quite a remarkable thing where there is, when they say multi-stakeholder governance, they, they, they mean it. It's stakeholders from everything from the academy to civil society, to private companies, to governments, all kind of at the same table uh, talking about the governance of the internet. And if you were a, a, a diplomat 
30 years ago where you would negotiate state to state, this would look like a completely foreign world. But nevertheless, that's the way it works. And so I wanted to pick up on this idea of politicization, state control, the multi-stakeholder model. Um, so in your mind, with this, the decision around the digital iron curtain in Russia, does it actually make this multi-stakeholder governance model obsolete? In other words, you know, can, if network operators can just pull out of Russia, does that make kind of control of critical internet resources like domain names and IP addresses and DNS stuff beside the point, if there can just be unilateral action, like what does it mean in the context of this multi-stakeholder governance model that we've all kind of come to know? I think there, there are going to be really important conversations and discussions about that in the next few years. And I think when all is said and done, what we might find is that the multi-stakeholder model is more important than ever before. And that this, you know, all of the issues around the digital iron curtain are establishing that. Um, now, the, the backstory to this is that the term internet governance is an oxymoron uh, because it's not just about governments and it involves far more than coordinating one thing. So what exactly are we talking about when we are talking about the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance? We're definitely not just talking about ICANN. But that is one area, one task of internet governance. Everything around the administration of names and numbers, um, it's not just ICANN either. It's um, domain name registrars. It's uh, the regional internet registry. So we see that with RIPE NCC, the regional internet registry for that region being drawn into this. Um, another whole area that hasn't come into this as much, but maybe it will going forward, is uh, the establishment of, of technical protocols. So that's an incredibly important part of the multi-stakeholder model that you know, has performed very well. And um, there's also, um, see what else is drawn into this, um, into what's happening, internet um, interconnection coordination. So I often draw the internet as a cloud erroneously because I don't know how to draw it. Um, it it's kind of funny to do that because the internet is a network of networks. It's not a cloud. It's not um, a series of pipes. It's not you know, as Vladimir Putin said one time, a CIA project, it's a network of networks. These networks are owned and operated by the private sector and they make decisions about how to interconnect and these are private contractual arrangements. Now they do this either bilaterally or at internet exchange points. And you see this as, um, uh, you see this coming into the digital uh, iron curtain around uh, the network operators pulling out of Russia. So Lumen, Cogent, you know, absolutely examples of that. But yet there are others who are staying connected. And because of the packet switching and uh, mesh configuration of the internet, there still is interconnection within Russia. Um, cybersecurity governance is another area that also is multi-stakeholder because it's carried out by a combination of global institutions, um, the private sector, and uh, certainly uh, governments are strongly involved in that area. Um, the one that's probably best known, Aaron, and you mentioned is the policy making role of content intermediaries, such as uh, social media companies, but far beyond that. They're making decisions about what speech to keep online, who to keep online, how to deal with uh, many things around this war, for example. And then, of course, across all these areas, uh, this, I think this is something that is under um, emphasized in Internet governance. And that is that governments do have a, an incredibly important role and the internet is highly regulated. The internet is highly coordinated by governments, uh, whether um, cybercrime and things like identity theft, intellectual property rights, privacy laws, look at the GDPR in the EU and the effect that that has, uh, trade laws, a host of other issues. And so you do see that coming into this um, environment as well with the EU sanctions that have prompted social media companies to filter out Russian state media. So every single, I, I'm sorry to be going on a little bit longer than I should on this, but I want to emphasize that there are many, many different functions. All of these uh, with the exception of one have come into play with the uh, digital iron curtain and that every single one of these areas has uh, public policy implications. You certainly see that now. Uh, you certainly see the role of the private sector you see the role of governments, you see the role of global um, institutions of internet governance. So if anything, 
the constellation of, and I'm going to suggest this and I'll look forward to getting reactions during the Q and A uh, because we'll have to see how this unfolds. But I think if anything, the constellation of actors and decisions coming into view around these digital infrastructure conflicts around Russia, it actually helps reveal a balance of powers, a constellation of, uh, you know, an array of diverse perspectives that make up the multi-stakeholder model and collectively keep the internet operational, which it still is. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And I was just going to say on the internet exchange point, again, many of the, the, the folks tuning in for this, uh, this webinar will probably have never even heard that term before. So I would commend to you, if you're watching this and you have never seen an internet exchange point before, go ahead and search for an image of an internet exchange point then recognize two things. Number one, the internet is not an ethereal cloud thing. It's like there is an infrastructure layer that is real. And chances are the video or the, the picture that you're looking at is an exchange point that's owned by a private actor and that's governed by contractual law. So this, this is what we talk about when we're talking about multiple stakeholders that make the internet go. Um, that's, that's certainly one of them. Um, I wanted to maybe go look uh, future forward a little bit and talk about emerging tech, right? So we've got the internet of things. We're, uh, we're hooking everything we possibly can up to the internet, the, the threat scape or the, 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 this kind of digital world is getting bigger and it's touching the real world in, in unforeseen ways. Now quantum protocols is something that you've written about um, protocol politics. Um, like Inter, interplanetary internet, like this is all set to get a whole lot worse with emerging technology. So I would, I wanted to ask you, um, how do you think these emerging technologies are going to factor into this type of analysis around a digital iron curtain or, you know, disinformation, computational propaganda, like we're, we're at a point in time, but the technology is not stopping and it's going to change uh, the way that we interact with it. So what are your thoughts on that? It's such an important question and such a critical issue going forward. And you and I previously had a public event, and thank you very much for it, on uh, the national security implications of the Internet of Things. And, you know, I, I won't talk about that now since we did another event, but I think that is an emerging area that is critically important. And, you know, it means that a disruption of a network may not be about disrupting the flow of information, but about, um, you know, a loss of life. If you talk about a connected medical device or, um, you know, and certainly the, the important um, uh, the things that keep society functioning, including the energy grid. So we've talked about that previously. We've talked about um, satellites. We've talked about, um, you know, many, many different areas of, of technology. I'll suggest one more. Um, quantum, what's the quantum issue in relation to the digital iron curtain? How will, let's say if this were happening in 10 years from now, instead of now, uh, how would the quantum computing advancements and not just quantum computing, but also quantum sensing and quantum communications, how would that affect this? Well, there's a connection with uh, cybersecurity. The resistance that is happening now requires some protection via encryption from surveillance and control. Um, protection of critical infrastructure from foreign attack depends upon encryption. Uh, the ability to authenticate people and information as real and websites as real depends upon um, encryption. And all of these rely on, on public key cryptography in particular. And quantum computing advancements are a credible threat to this entire infrastructure because, and to the, you know, to the internet infrastructure writ large uh, because of the ability to potentially crack the algorithms um, and, and ciphers on which uh, public key cryptography depends. So a lot of people talk about this as an issue of individual privacy or securing intelligence in the economy. But what I would suggest is that this is about way more than that. Uh, public key cryptography, it fuels the entire internet um, from uh, virtual private networks to um, authenticating identities to uh, certifying that a website is who they say it is. Uh, so DNS queries um, and even controlling access to Bitcoin in some cases. So not surprisingly, there are a lot of efforts. There's a lot of concern about this. Um, it's a, a, one of my current research projects 
Uh, many of the efforts are nascent, they're future looking, there's work in standard setting institutions, but this, this issue of protecting infrastructure from, uh, this, is, this is an issue, Erin, of anticipatory governance and an issue of protecting um, infrastructure and how we uh, communicate with each other, how national security unfolds and also the digital economy uh, from a, a clear and present future um, technology-based attack. So I would suggest that as the one that would be the emerging issue. Yeah, for sure. And for the, for the benefit of our colleagues that aren't uh, au courant when it comes to quantum, basically in the digital world, everything is either a one or a zero. That is, that is binary code. It is the law of the internet. And that's the way computers work. They look at a one, they look at a zero. The thing with quantum computers is it can superimpose, which means it can be both simultaneously a one and a zero. How that works, I've got no idea. But the point of it is it will take compute power and just change everything we've ever known. And so what Laura is saying about RSA encryption or public key encryption, is that it's a it's a complex math problem in order to but what what happens when you have a quantum computer that's capable of guessing that password 500 billion times a second so you can brute force you can basically take the lock and open it up by virtue of of this new compute power so it's pretty wild stuff but no thanks for that laura it's uh it's uh i think an important observation and i i would also say if we can get our act together the the move to quantum should be a non-event, right? It, we don't need like a you know a millennia. Oh my God, what happens when when the when the clocks go to two thousand and all computers shut down? Like we know this is coming. Let's as you say, do some anticipatory governance, get our act together, and hopefully the rollover to quantum is a non-event. But who knows? Yes, and post quantum cryptography efforts that are coming from of computer science, from uh, theoretical physicists, and also from the internet standard setting communities are very interesting to follow. For sure. Um, okay, so do you want to, I know we've got a few minutes left and I want, we've got some questions coming. Do you want to talk a bit about cyber war? I mean, I'm happy to have a conversation about that too, if you wish. Well, why don't I ask you about cyber war, Aaron? Because uh, you, know, you, you wrote a very interesting piece recently about uh, national security in Canada. And, um, I, and it, it, in my opinion, it's, it's been very interesting to see people ask the question, and I think it's the wrong question, they're saying, why is cyber war not occurring uh, to an extensive uh, degree? And I would say that what's happening in Ukraine with, um, you know, first there were DDoS attacks, and there have been longstanding attacks on the energy system, there were attacks on a satellite, and there's literally a bombing of information and communication technologies. So if that's not cyber war, I don't know what is, but um, still there are people who are um, wondering why is there not more uh, cyber attacks? And I think by that, they probably mean throughout the EU, throughout Canada and the United States, in Brazil and elsewhere. So I wanted to, uh, let me ask you um, in light of your expertise, um, is cyber war occurring? And uh, what are you most worried about? Okay, that's a yeah, that's a solid question. Um, I would say for sure it is. I mean, like there's 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 no there's no debating it. But there's there's three interrelated problems that we have to we have to address. Number one is secret deployment. So these 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 capabilities are deployed in secret. So it's not like launching a missile or whatever. These capabilities are deployed in a clandestine fashion. Problem number one. Problem number two. They're developed in secret. So we actually don't know what everyone has in the toolkit, right? So this is another area where uh, military doctrine is challenged because usually you can look over the neighbor's fence and you can understand what their capability set looks like. Um, and number three, uh, the, the doctrine is secret. So we don't know necessarily where the red lines are. There are some, some markers of that, but there's something, a phenomenon that I've never seen before taking place right now, where you have governments trying to advance um, what they call responsible state practice. And so there's something called the, the UNGGE. And the UNGGE issues a report and they say, okay, there is, a, there is a norm here. We will not mess with each other's critical infrastructure. Okay, that's a norm. You agree, that's a norm. Okay, we're all agreed that's a norm. Don't do it. It's not responsible. Then behind the scenes, you have exactly the opposite state practice, right? We are loading each other's networks with malware as quick as we possibly can. There's one former uh, intelligence official that said the hard part's not loading the network with malware. The hard part is keeping track of it all. So we are loading up critical infrastructure just as quick as we can with these exploits. Adversaries are doing it to us. And our public face is this is not responsible. So we are developing weapons in secret. We're deploying them in secret, 
and we're we're doing we have a military doctrine that's secret. So all that to say, my to answer your question in a pointed way, my biggest concern is we're going to find out where one of those red lines is by accident, um, and it's going to lead to a kinetic strike. Incredibly important point. Yeah, so that's that's kind of where I come out on that. Um, do you want to uh, do you want to take some questions from the audience? We've got a, a few, so why don't I why don't I go to the questions from the audience now? So uh, uh, Avery Doria asks, do you think the Internet Governance Forum serves a useful role in bringing the many stakeholder actors uh, from various layers and stakeholder groups of the Internet together? If not, can it? So it's a it's a question related to the Internet Governance Forum. Is it still relevant uh, in light of what we're talking about today? I, that's a great question. The Internet Governance Forum is. Um, you know, an effort started by the United Nations. The first one was in, you know, Avri can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, the first one I was there, it was in 2006 in Athens. I, I think that was the first one. And uh, since then it has taken place in a different country every year. It brings together people from these uh, global institutions that we've been talking about in the technical community and certainly ICANN along with civil society and increasingly private actors attend and uh, you know what it is is it, it's a it's a conference. It's a series of discussions. It's an avenue for uh, different kinds of um, uh, coalitions to form, um, collaborations to ensue, and you know an airing of uh, you know contention. And so in that regard, I think that it is valuable. Um, I think it, it brings people together, and I think um, also the amount of expertise floating around the Internet Governance Forum is uh, vitally important. And especially in the role of translating that to policymakers and the general public. So I, I hope it does continue. Super, thanks. Yeah, me too. Um, and it's uh, it was snowing here yesterday, and I recall very fondly the Internet Governance Forum in Bali. So um, uh, I will I'll look forward to future meetings. So uh, David, uh, oh, there's a comment. He says, "Let's have a series of presentations on interrelated topics. Too much to cover in an hour." David, I agree with you. We'll get back to you on that. And Laura and I, for what it's worth, we organized this. We had a conversation on Friday. We put this together quickly because we realized that this is an important topic that we wanted to get to. So here's a question coming in, Laura, from Hall. Holly says, you bring up the issue of quantum computing being a threat to public key cryptography. Of course, efforts are already underway to develop new quantum safe encryption algorithms that will protect internet communications going forward. The question, what is the likelihood of a divergence in international standards in this area? Yes, uh, that's uh, Holly captured something that's going on right now, and that's that, um, and maybe it's appropriate at this nascent stage of development, is that there are many different standard setting organizations, some from the what I would call the core um, internet standard setting organizations uh, that we, we know so well. The IETF has a working group on this. Um, the ITU is doing work. The IEEE is doing work. Um, ISO. Um, Centelec, uh, you know, there, there, all across the world, there is work on quantum safe cryptography and looking at ways to shore up the existing infrastructure of the internet, either with quantum or just shoring it up as a way to protect against um, anticipations of quantum computing power. So at this point, there are multiple competing efforts and um, there probably should be a bit more coordination as we move from these um, like innovative uh, it's, you know, early efforts into something that can be wide, implemented in a wise, widespread way. So maybe it's appropriate. It kind of reminds me of the way standards have developed around the IOT. IOT. You know, there is um, a resurgence of proprietary approaches. Uh, there is um, a lot of consortia building around this. And uh, it's something to watch very closely. And I do hope that it moves from this fragmented innovation uh, platform arena into something that is more harmonized over time? No, it's a solid question too. And also, you know, is technical standard setting. Um, when I talk to people about this, I can literally watch their eyes glaze over, but it is so important. And your argument, Laura, that you make about, about um, power and control and proxies in the, the architecture of the internet, ditto a hundred times over in technical standard setting, right? Like it is, there is a geostrategic and geoeconomic competition going on there. And um, actually, uh, apropos to our conversation about the Global Commission on Internet Governance. So that was chaired by Carl Bildt, who's the former uh, Prime Minister of Sweden. One of the best papers I've ever read on the geoeconomics and geopolitics of standard setting was written by Carl. It was about uh, Europe 
competing in this area. So uh, awesome question, great answer. So we've got another question from Courtney Radish, who's a, a fellow at CG. Uh, good to see you, Courtney. Uh, do you think that the efforts uh, to deny Russia infrastructure-based services and capabilities will signal to other countries that they should create their own internets? Ah, this is a good one. So the law of unintended consequences is like, how is this all going to go? And you say, can you ask me in 25 years from now? I share that question, Courtney. I think it's a really important one. And I think there's going to be a lot of soul searching and a lot of work in the coming years to figure out um, you know, what is happening, see what the results are, and uh, whether it should happen. But I think the fact that ICANN and RIPE NCC and also strong statements from the Internet Society about keeping a universal digital infrastructure open and available, I think that that will help mitigate against that kind of fragmentation. Um, so that might be another reason to, um, you know, applaud what they've done here to, to you know, to to mitigate against fragmentation. Um, but I think that that's a conversation that has to be had. And, um, and I, I'd love to be part of that conversation. Super, thanks for that, Laura. Uh, Kapil Goyal says, great discussion happening, highly insightful. Thank you, uh, that's a comment. Okay, uh, hoping this inter interesting discussion is recorded. Oh, it will be recorded and viewed later, no worries there. Um, okay, so here's another one. Uh, can you reflect, so it's about the multi-stakeholder internet sanctions focusing solely on military infrastructure. So, so there, is, there is a separate kind of military infrastructure. Can we abstract and is there a way to focus just on that? Is there a way to zero in on military infrastructure and not um, what you would call the universal internet? Yes, absolutely, in many different ways. Uh, there are IP addresses that are specific to uh, military uses. There are domain names that are specific to military. There are top level domains that are related to that. Um, there are forms of encryption. There are, you know, ge there's geocaching. Um, I think, it, you know, there's interconnection. There are private networks used within military, within the military. So I think what the question is asking, is there a way to be, use an X-Acto knife to target those kinds of infrastructures without having collateral damage onto uh, citizens. And I think it, um, the answer is yes, in some cases and no in other cases. And I think if we were sitting here with a whiteboard, we might be able, especially with this group that's been amassed, um, we might be able to come up with a taxonomy of which can be done with an X-Acto knife and which um, have cascading effects that go into um, you know, collateral damage on citizens. So if you look at something like um, targeted um, malware, uh, that can be very effective, but that also can leak into the universal internet. We've seen that happen many times. Um, if you look at ways to target um, private infrastructure and um, you know, the, 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 the protocols and the interconnection underneath that, it's a little bit easy, easier to target. Um, so I think it depends. It depends, uh, but that is far better than just pulling the plug on the entire network. All right, we've got two minutes left, um, so we're in the lightning round. Uh, David asks a question about VPN access in Russia, and he says, but Visa and MasterCard are suspending payments. So can you talk about that, the, the nexus between finance and mobile application technology? I agree. That's, a, that's an incredible problem. How can um, acts of resistance occur if they can't download those apps and pay for them? Um, so I, I think based on the question, he's concerned about that. And I think that is a rightful concern. And that is part of the soul searching. And, you know, it, I would ask the same question that was asked about the military. Is there a way to have an exacto knife way to do it, to allow that kind of dissent and resistance to occur without taking the entire system down? I think that has to be the answer. Okay. Um, all right. We actually, you know what? One, one more. Um, uh, so Jenna Carter asks, what role do you think for multilateral and multi-stakeholder groupings like the Freedom Online Coalition, which uh, footnote is being chaired by Canada this year, what role should those informal groupings of states play in responding to the digital iron curtain? They have an incredibly important um, role. I think the next step is some norm setting around this and um, you know, looking especially at some of the, the, the issues around cyber war uh, limitations and open questions that Aaron mentioned before. So I would say that as part of the multi-stakeholder internet governance environment, that does include multilateral discussions, dialogues, and you know, the role for nation states. And I, I hope that there is 
uh, a coming together on that to solve some of the problems that we've mentioned today. Super. And I'm, I'm, I apologize if we didn't get to your question. There was just there was just too many uh, to, to get to. But thank you so much for uh, for attending. And I will just say this. Thanks to Laura, um, you know, to be able to come in on short notice, have a conversation like this and explain what's happening in the world in a mature, in a knowledgeable, in an articulate way um, on something that's incredibly complicated and incredibly um, uh, inter multifaceted is just a real treat, Laura. I'm, I'm privileged to have you as a colleague and as a friend. Thank you so much for what you've, what you've uh, done with us here today. If things are unfolding in real time and I really appreciate CG offering this platform to, for us to discuss it. And I'm sure we'll come back to many of these issues. And thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks for attending. Have a great day. Stay safe.